He just he was changing into his running shorts midway. He was going to run to the airport and he ran to the airport. David was he's very afraid of sharks, which was sort of uh, amusing to me, given that as a seal, he had to spend a lot of time in water, cold water, ice bath, cold shower, cyclic hyperventilation. <sighs> also hard. So this limbic friction and David just seems to seek what I call limbic friction in every domain of life. You know, the one thing about David is what you see on social media is actually what you get when you interact with David. You had David Goggins in the lab to study him for fear. What did you learn from looking at that guy? Yeah, David's, David's great. I always chuckle with David because you know, the one thing about David is what you see on social media is actually what you get when you interact with David. We worked long hours one day and I was, everyone was ready to tap out. This was a bunch of people in uh, Silicon Valley for a day, you know, doing some workshop type thing. And he just, he was changing into his running shorts midway. He was going to run to the airport and he ran to the airport as far as I know. To I get his flight. I believe so, you know. <laughs> um, but there was this moment of, should we continue? Should we take a break? And he was like, no, let's keep going, keep going. Um, everything you see and read and hear about David is exactly how he shows up. It's really wonderful. Um, he came to the lab and he did, you know, we have a virtual version of the shark thing, um, which of course is not the same as the real experience. But for people who are afraid of sharks, it's quite scary for them and allows us to study fear. David was, he's very afraid of sharks, which was sort of uh, amusing to me, given that as a seal, he had to spend a lot of time in water. But uh, he was first one in, wanted to do the VR, talked about how he didn't like it, but um, but that's why he did it. You know, constant uh, testing himself. In fact, I think even though David's quite successful, I think and has many, many options of how to spend his time. I believe this is correct. I think right now he's doing fire jumping. He's um, fighting fires in the wilderness by zip lining in or fast lining in or jumping out of planes. So he's constantly pushing that, uh, that friction lever to create uh, or build or further build this thing about leaning into friction. And this is a term that isn't really scientific but that I decided to coin because this idea of limbic friction, that when we're very tired and we need to be in action, or when we're very stressed and we need to perform in a more calm and controlled way, there's friction on both sides. Getting out of bed when we're exhausted, hard, very hard often. Leaning into action in a calm and deliberate way when we're freaking out, like going to give a public lecture if one has fear of public speaking, also hard. So this limbic friction, and David just seems to seek what I call limbic friction in every domain of life. Is that like exposure therapy for limbic friction then? Essentially, yeah. I mean, what you're training and improving when you're getting better at dealing with stress is this ability to tolerate high amounts of adrenaline in your body and to think clearly and function well. I mean, adrenaline is epinephrine and just a little bit of physiology. It's released from the adrenals, obviously, above the kidneys. That gets your body organs amped up and energized. It can't cross the so-called blood-brain barrier. You have a high restriction fence that we call the blood-brain barrier around the brain. Keep bad molecules out. Adrenaline therefore is released also within the brain from a little cluster of neurons called locus ceruleus, the name doesn't matter. So when you are stressed, your brain and your body both wake up and that adrenaline hijacks certain systems, narrows your visual focus, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at almost all stress inoculation protocols, Cold water, ice bath, cold shower, cyclic hyperventilation. <sighs> Those all do the same thing. They generate a lot of adrenaline release in the brain and a lot of adrenaline release in the body. But it's different if, those, if the adrenaline in the brain and body is evoked by you, that you did it. Because under conditions under which you did the ice bath deliberately and now you're wide awake and really, really alert, there's this feeling that you have options. It wasn't done to you, but you can train up an ability to, for instance, think c clearly and calmly. Um, maybe even do some simple math problems in your head, or maybe try and relax while there's all this adrenaline in your system. And that carries over so that when you, you know, we've all done it, you're driving along, the person in front of you stops short, and you're almost in the accident, right? There's that moment where you could panic or that moment where you could you know, road rage or that moment where you could freak out. But if you are familiar with the feeling of adrenaline in your brain and body, you navigate that in a, in a calmer way. How? Well, because adrenaline is generic. There's no adrenaline for the car crash, adrenaline for the heights, adrenaline for the, the uh, 
the relationship situation, it's all the same. So we can get better. We can raise our stress threshold, as I like to refer to it. And that can be done through cold water or cyclic hyperventilation, ideally not at the same time. But cold water, you know, is a universal stimulus for creating adrenaline release. And there's a big range of cold, not infinite, but a big range of cold in which you can generate adrenaline without harming your tissue. Whereas with heat, you get into a very hot environment or very low oxygen environment. You'll also get a lot of adrenaline, but you can also suffocate and burn yourself. So this is why cold is used in Navy SEAL screening and training. And this is why I think so many people really like the ice bath and cold showers. It has a bunch of other positive effects, but it is a great trigger for adrenaline.